Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another course with Rabbi Friedman. Hi, Rabbi Friedman, welcome. To good find evening. Secrets to a Strong Marriage with Rabbi Manus Friedman. Explore ancient Jewish principles that unlock spiritual and emotional bonding for lifelong relationships. So we're, we're happy to welcome everyone to the um, introduction to the course. And we hope that you all join us. It's going to be an amazing journey. And um, Rabbi Friedman, tell us tell us a little bit about uh, what what the course is going to be about, and then maybe we'll have a little time to hear from um, from some of you what you hope to gain from this course, what you'd like to see. So thank you, Rabbi Friedman. Actually, I was thinking. Uh... What have, what what have people experienced in their relationships as a result of COVID? What did COVID do to marriages four years ago? Now we can look back and see. Did it make marriages better? Did it weaken marriages? Did it destroy marriages? What was the experience? I'm sure there were people who were devastated. Certainly those relationships that were on the rocks already probably could not survive the, uh, the COVID lockdowns and being forced to be in the house together when you really don't like each other can be quite painful. But then again, there must have been many people who, whose marriages were on the rocks, but once they realized that they have nothing else but each other, their relationship became much improved. And if it did, that was a very meaningful and profound uh, realization. And their marriages are much better off than the average marriage was before COVID. Because the real bond of marriage and the feeling of it, the experience of it is what would I be without you? Not, not professionally, of course. You can be a doctor without being married. But what would I be without you? In other words, you have become my identity in a, in a healthy way. That is a marriage. Anything less than that it is just a friendship. And who realized this more than the person whose marriage was nothing special, but because they were forced to live with each other and deal with each other in the quarantine of, of, uh, of the COVID, they discovered this much greater than friendly feeling that they had for each other and the realization that I could have lost you we were headed down a bad path and we could have ended up divorced and that thought is horrifying now you know what marriage is more profound than most people This is what we need to learn. What is it that it makes the marriage a magical relationship, not a good friendship, not a love affair, something bigger and more magical, more, more sacred and divine than anything else we do in life? A close second is of course giving birth. 
but it's got to come second because first you marry, then you give birth. So what is that? What is that magic? And maybe you've heard you've heard this uh, this analogy. Two friends who are on a ship, and the ship is sinking, and everyone is panicking, and one of the friends manages to save himself on a lifeboat. And once he's safe and calm, he realizes that he forgot about his friend. Everyone will assure him that it's understandable, forgivable. There was a panic. There was a panic. You lost your mind. You weren't thinking straight. So yeah, you forgot your friend. Even a friend of 40 years. But if a newlywed couple were on the boat and in a panic, the man saves himself and only then thinks of his wife, no one, no one would comfort him. No one would assure him that they understand and that it's perfectly normal. What is it about marriage? They've only been married for a month. The friends have been friends for 40 years. But if you forget your best friend, we understand. Panic. But even in panic, you forgot your wife? Unforgivable. Unacceptable. This is the, the miracle of marriage. And that's what we need to dig into and understand it, appreciate it, and find ways of feeling it, living it, being. It's, it's, not, it's not for nothing that marriage and, and being fruitful and multiplying are the first instructions given to the first human beings in the Torah, and it hasn't changed at all. It is still the holiest thing you, human beings can do. What about the phenomenon of having children without a marriage? sometimes even under very negative circumstances. So are children always the product of marriage? Well, they're always the product of a man and a woman. In 5,784 years, we haven't found another way of doing it. And even, even when, when the, the science gets involved and the labs, <clears throat> you still have to have a man and a woman. They, they just don't have to see each other. So what happens is the, the male and female energy, which when combined properly, creates a marriage, and that creates a dream. And that can happen when there is an, an exchange between a man and a woman that they may not even have wanted. In other words, it's still the magic of male and female bonding, except that they avoided the bond. So first there's a man and a woman, then there's a baby, which is why the marriage always takes precedent over the children. If you have to save your marriage or you have to be 
devoted to your children, you save the marriage first. Then you tend to the children. The marriage also takes precedence over the honoring of parents. Torah says it very clearly. Therefore, should a man leave his mother and father, as good as that relationship may be, in order to cleave to his wife and become one. So the marriage comes before the parents and before the children. It is the center of life, the cradle of life. But as uh, Rifki said, if anyone has a particular angle or aspect of marriage that needs to be explored in the course, now is a good, a good time to recommend it or suggest it so that we make sure that it gets covered. Anyone with an idea? Anyone want to share an idea? Why do we need more talk about marriage? Our grandparents got married. Our great-grandparents got married. Did they have all this talk and all this information and all these books and articles? Or they were instinctively more in tune? Or maybe they just didn't have good marriages. I don't know. What, what happened between that time and our time? have to welcome our world traveler. Um, so, so some people are posting questions in the chat. I can read those. Let's do. Yeah. Um, and I think a, a lot of the questions are going to be different situations that can challenge a marriage. And, and really what we want to cover in the course is how strong is marriage? Is it what, what, what is, maybe start with what can't be fixed in a marriage, what can't be looked over and everything else, marriage is powerful enough to work through. Um, I wonder if that's something to address. Like what what would make a marriage not work? And, and then all these other examples of, of things that people are gonna bring up, um, maybe you'll, you'll explain how how really we can work through everything because marriage is that magical. Which one should we start with? The challenges that, that could be helped or what can't? Well, just briefly, there is no challenge that can't be helped except the unwillingness. If you don't want to be married, not not because you found something wrong with your spouse. You just don't want to be married to anybody. That That's... There's where your freedom of choice is. Our freedom of choice is to marry or not to marry. Who we marry is God's choice, always. It seems like our choice, but it's not really... We all know that from experience. You get married and you discover this is not the person I married. Of course not. You didn't know who you were marrying. You thought you knew. Obviously, God made sure that you would marry each other. Now, work it out. So the freedom of choice is to marry or not marry. If you choose not to marry, there's no cure for that. Even if you were forced to marry, you wouldn't be married because you 
you don't believe in marriage. But if you believe in marriage and you're already married to someone, I've never yet seen something that was impossible to fix. It may be too painful, maybe uh, too in, too daunting, but impossible. So, for example, there are people who ask for my advice, and I say, "Call it off. Get divorced." because of the issues that they're having. But then the same week, I could be talking to another couple with the same issues. And I would never suggest they get divorced. Work it out, fix it. Because they want to fix it. So there's no condition that is objectively impossible. I haven't seen one yet. Couples who are so far apart on everything and they've developed a real distaste for each other. They can't stand each other. They can't look at each other. You think, okay, this is gone. This is done. And in a very short time, it suddenly turns around and they're, they're an amazing couple. So it's not the issue that makes it impossible. It's, it's the interest or lack of interest. Let's, let's read some of the uh, issues that people are. I think from the course, what we hope to get is um, to regain that excitement and interest in marriage itself rather than just the person when you get to the essence of marriage that's what brings up the interest again then you can see past the the challenges of the person that's what we hope to to, to cover but some of the comments um how to go about financial stress without having the fears strain the peace and connection Well, what would the answer be to that in general terms? The, the immediate reaction or response is, and if you get divorced, you'll have more money? No, but you won't need as much. Oh, so what's happening is you'll still be poor, but you won't have a marriage anymore. So where's the improvement here? In other words, you can't blame poverty on the marriage. You may be poor, but at least you have each other. So why should poverty destroy the marriage? I think in general, poor people have better marriages than rich people. Is that not true? Well, let's put it differently. Rich people don't necessarily have better marriages. I think what usually happens is that the poverty makes you so desperate that you have to blame it on someone, so you blame it on each other. She says you don't work hard enough, and he says you don't support me. Which may be true, but that's not why you're poor. I remember a person saying, how can we have another child? We barely have enough for the one child that we have. How could we afford to have another one? I don't make enough for two children. I said to him, of course you don't make enough for two children because you don't have two children. 
if God gives you another child, he's going to have to give you more money for that child. But why should he give it to you in advance? Have the child and God will give you what you need to feed the child. So Having the other child is not going to make you poor. It'll make God more responsible. So just bill it to God. I think from look thinking back at it, the the, arg the the devastation of poverty is when they get into an argument about whose fault it is. That's what kills the relationship, not the poverty. The guy starts blaming his wife. She spends too much. I asked her, you got to live within a budget. She won't. It's her fault. Of course, she says, the man doesn't know how to run a business. I tell him, I give him advice. If he followed my advice, he'd be rich now. Any, any other suggestions on what we need to cover? Another question. What about addiction, sex, drugs, alcohol? It seems like such a deal breaker. Well, it's, it's a real life destroyer, not just a marriage destroyer. So you see, in those cases, people get a little confused. They go for marriage counseling. Why do you need marriage counseling? You need medical attention. It's not a marriage crisis. If a spouse comes down with pneumonia, you go for marriage counseling? Treat the pneumonia. A person has an addiction or... That's not a marriage crisis. So the person needs treatment, but not, not to save the marriage, but to save their life. You know, I wrote this book in, back in the 90s, 1990s. I wrote this book on relationships called Doesn't Anyone Blush Anymore? And I was selling the book and signing it, and somebody said, I read the book. How come there's no chapter there on abuse? Ah, that never occurred to me. I said, well, this is a book on relationships. Abuse is not part of a relationship. And besides, if you're being abused, put down the book and call the police. <laughs> Don't look it up in a book. So we want to stick to the uh, marriage issues, relationship issues, not health issues. That's a medical book. So what does a spouse do if a if the other spouse is suffering from an illness? You run around, find a good doctor, get treatment, encourage treatment. Whether it's an addiction or, or a pneumonia. 
or God forbid, more serious illness. You support the spouse during the healing process. But that's not marriage counseling. So, see, clarifying issues is itself the biggest blessing. When we're confused, you, you can't find your way out. You can't find a path if you're confused. When things are clear, then the path to the solution becomes clear. So when we call things by the wrong name, it, it's not helpful at all. And just for example, a person goes through a trauma, any kind of trauma, birth trauma, uh, near death experience. And people immediately recommend therapy, psychological therapy, go to, go to a psychiatrist, go to a to psychi psychologist. But you see, there's a difference between mental problems and trauma. Freud didn't treat people with trauma. <laughs> he was treating people who caused trauma because of their mental illness. Trauma doesn't mean you're mentally deficient or disturbed. It means you're carrying a burden you don't want to carry. So here's a quick or, or simple way of identifying. If a person says, comes to the doctor and says, you know, I, I have this habit, I keep doing this, I keep losing, I keep messing up, I keep, it's crazy, why do I do this? You don't have a mental problem. Because you said it's crazy. In other words, your mind is clear. You don't have a mental problem. It's your mind that is working well that can't understand why you're not behaving well. So if a person says, doctor, help me, I'm, I'm acting crazy. This is crazy. Well, then don't try to convince the mind that it's crazy. The mind already knows that. So correctly speaking, none of Freud's methods should be applied to people with trauma. It only confuses everybody. Psychoanalysis and psycho uh, talk therapy was for people with mental illness. Today, we don't even treat people with mental illness. We put them on drugs. But to not know the difference between trauma and mental illness is, 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 is dangerous. You know, sometimes I found that a person who's suffering a trauma and says, this is so crazy. Why do I do this? It's crazy. All you need to do is agree to how crazy it is and laugh about it, and all of a sudden the problem goes away. Just acknowledging, oh yeah, it's so crazy. Why do we do that? Ah, I don't know. Okay, never mind. I can live with it. <clears throat> so clarity, definitions, those are so important because things today are very confused. And by the same token, a guy comes to the doctor and says, yesterday I was almost hit by a car. 
missed me by an inch. I'm so traumatized. You're not traumatized. You're frightened. You had a scare, not a trauma. Not every experience is a trauma. Sometimes trauma, real trauma, comes from the most insignificant little event, but it was traumatizing. And on the other hand, you can have a near-death experience. You can end up in traction your entire body, and you don't know if you're going to make it, and it's touch and go, and you survive, and you're fine, and there's no trauma. But you are more careful driving the car after that. <laughs> so first of all, mental illness is not the same as trauma. And not every frightening or overwhelming experience is necessarily traumatic. And thirdly, not every habit is an addiction. This guy said, what should I do? I'm addicted to pornography. I said, you're addicted? He says, yeah. I said, is that a professional uh, diagnosis or is that your own opinion? I said, it's my own opinion. I can't stop. I said, why can't you stop? He says, because I enjoy it. So, well, if you enjoy it, it's not an addiction. It's a passion. What is the difference between a passion and an addiction? <laughs> not supposed to be passionate about anything? If you're passionate about something, that's a healthy sign of life. Why is it an addiction? which means as long as you love doing it, it's not an addiction. An addiction is when you keep doing it when there's no more pleasure. So a big part of our course is going to be defining words that we use so that we don't harm ourselves by misusing terms and expressions. And passing judgment on ourselves that is not even real, not true. It's going to be fun because it is not complicated. It's never complicated. It can often be confusing. But life is not complicated. Morality is not complicated. Right and wrong is not complicated. It's rather simple. Except for the misinformation or disinformation that we're bombarded with. <clears throat> Another thing we need to talk about What is the difference between love and vulnerability? Or what is the relationship between love and vulnerability? 
And what's more important, to be vulnerable or to be loving? What keeps marriages together, love or respect? Is another subject. Why does marriage involve a man and a woman? Why not two men or two women? Which, of course, leads to the question of what is a woman? What is a man? These are vital and yet simple issues, questions, definitions. What's what? It's the kind of thing we should know when we're seven or eight. But very little is said about these things, and so we don't know. And yet we have the courage to try to get married. Which I guess is a good thing. We don't want to give up on marriage because then it's all over. Oh, one other the profound subject that is very simple. What is the difference between sex and intimacy? If we don't know the difference, we're in trouble. What is the difference between feeling needy and feeling needed? Big subjects. Not complicated. There you go. Okay. Thanks, so why? Well, I just want to say, like, my the difference. Now, I have a question, but I want to just share something real quick about the difference between sex and intimacy. Uh, in my opinion. So sex is like the desired and animalistic desire, the instinct that we have that is similar to any other animal that exists that we want to have sex to reproduce. Intimacy is the special physical connection between a man and a woman to reach that divine completeness of like a female and a, a masculine and feminine together in the most ultimate way of connection, that including physical connection as well. So if the sex like or the intimacy is created using a special connection to each God or serve God through marriage, it will be blessed and it will be more intimate. So that's my opinion. So let's nice have a question. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. You're just giving a lot of help in that sense. Uh, I have two questions and you are very vital. You know, it would be very nice to have an answer to it. The first question is, um, Anger, the external anger that you take it on your spouse, with like crazy voice or being mean and blaming them, and the internal anger that maybe eats you from taking that, taking behaviors and, and just shutting up because you can't say anything. What to do with that? And what is that? Right? If this can, if nothing cannot then break a marriage, if this is all the time, all the time happening. What to do about it. The second question is what if marriage for you is not in itself very profound and important to make you give it, you know, part of yourself in the state of, you know, in it, and instead of that, you just your your head is full of fixing other people's problems or taking care of your problems. And you're taking all of this inside and just releasing it on the uh, um, from the outside and releasing it on the inside of the house. 
which is affect people around you. But at this moment, what about your people? Like what they can feel? Useless, nothing, not taken care of, wanted to be put down for work problems, war happening around, right? So thank you so much. Those are big issues. <clears throat> we'll definitely have to put that on the list of of topics. But you remind me of a very important point. Marriage cannot be a means to an end. You can't get married for a purpose. Marriage is the purpose. It's like the buck stops here. Marriage is the, the final, the final outcome. It's not leading to something bigger or better. It is bigger and better. Most people, when they get married, think something good is going to come from this. Maybe even children. And there should be children, but that's not the purpose of marriage. The purpose of marriage is to be married. We got to really understand that. Like a guy who many years ago said to me, I have been married for eight years. What have I got to show for it? See what his problem is? What do I have to show for it? In other words, I got married in order to achieve something bigger and better than marriage, and it didn't happen. I'm still just married. <laughs> That's like saying I got married for the reward, and there's no reward. Marriage doesn't need a reward. I don't know, it's like saying, you know, I've been breathing all day and what have I got to show for it? You don't breathe for a purpose. <laughs> you breathe because that's how you live. You don't marry for a purpose, not even the purpose of having children. You marry to be married. And that's something we need to wrap our heads around because we're not taught that. It may even be counterintuitive. But I think that's what you were saying, Gasser. Intimacy is not a means to an end. Sex is a means to an end. Nobody, <clears throat> nobody in their right mind ever said, all you need in life is sex. If you have sex, you have everything. Nobody ever said that. Sex is not an end in itself. It's a tool. You can use it destructively, you can use it constructively, but it is not the end goal. Intimacy is the end goal. When you have intimacy, you're there. You've arrived at your destination. But where is it going to take me? It doesn't take you. you you've arrived. Anyway, this is going to be a fascinating course. Will definitely change lives, maybe even save lives. Mark? Hi. Um, 
I have a hi, Rabbi Friedman. Nice to talk to you again. I, I have a couple questions. Um, first is, uh, uh, you said that you should put the the marriage before, I mean, the relationship before the children. So my question is, when when you have differences in kind of uh, how to deal with children, or you know, and and those differences may, you know, affect both the children and the marriage, like. Do you do you put down your differences with you know the children and that affects the children, but then if you you know you know try to uh, enforce your your will, you affect the marriage. So you know what what to do in that situation. And the other question is, when when people are are so uh, from different ends of the earth, uh, culturally, religiously, potentially. Uh, you know, with 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 their differences, you know, do you have any advice on on how to bridge those gaps? That's part of what we're going to be talking about. But generally speaking, the more different, the more further apart you are in all of those areas, the more amazing it is that God would marry you off to each other. <laughs> so you have to marvel at that. God really thinks that we could make a good couple? <laughs> wow. That should be encouraging. So so it's for a reason, right? <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Now, what happens if you disagree on how to raise the children and it negatively affects your relationship to each other? You can be absolutely sure that it is also affecting the children. So if you're really worried about the children, don't do that. It's not good for the children. The, the harmony between mother and father is the strongest influence in a child's life. So you want what's best for the children? Give them a happy couple. Sorry, I, 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 I interrupt. Um... I have a question because you say like marriage, the first no purpose of marriage. Marriage is just for marriage. Um, but what if your marriage actually bring you back to 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 uh, being a Jew in that in this case? Like the like you see the purpose of marriage just bring bring your soul back to become a Jew. So close to God wasn't really like the marriage itself. So, the marriage bring, you know, cause you to, to, I guess you're saying, have something else. Have yeah, have something else. Like, really bring you back to be, 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 be Jews or close to Hashem. It wasn't really between you and your spouse like that. It's not, it's not the marriage. It's what's lacking in the marriage. In other words, if the marriage was good, it would bring you closer to God. If it's not bringing you closer to God, then it's not a marriage the way it's supposed to be. The marriage is wonderful. I'm going to give you a quick example. <laughs> when I was a kid, my mother took me to the doctor because I had stomach aches. This was an old fashioned European doctor, very intimidating. You know, they were very, they were very um, imperious. Like the doctor was everything and you never argued with a doctor. And anyway, so I'm eight years old and I sit down in this office and it's very frightening. And the doctor says, what is the problem? I said, my stomach. He says, a stomach is not a problem. <laughs> if you don't have a stomach, is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> your stomach is never a problem. Something is causing your stomach a problem. The marriage is never the problem. What's preventing it from being a marriage, that's the problem. And there can be many things that get in the way of the, of, of the bonding that marriage is supposed to be. 
But when that bond is there, it is the healthiest thing for the children. When it's not so strong, children immediately start to react. Can't hide anything from children. So to argue about what's best for children is the worst thing you can do for children. <laughs> That's for an ironic. So if you do have disagreements, never in front of the children. And it should never become a reason for estrangement or coldness or being turned off to each other. Difference of opinion is fine. As long as it doesn't become a rejection of the person, even if you reject their opinion. So, so are you saying it takes discipline to withhold your opinion? I mean, no, no, no. Talk about your opinion, argue your opinion. But if your if your wife doesn't agree, that's also that's okay. Everybody has an opinion. I always always think of that this way. The husband has an opinion about how to raise children because of his experience when he was raised by his parents. The wife has an attitude or opinion about raising children based on how she was raised by her parents. And so you argue which one is the right one. Now, what happens if you go with the husband's opinion? Children will turn out to be like the husband. <laughs> what if you go with the wife's opinion? The children will turn out to be like the wife. Is any one of those not acceptable? <laughs> then you have a, a much bigger problem than your children. <laughs> Actually, you should want, the husband should want the children to turn out to be like the wife. And the wife should want the children to turn out to be like the husband. Hey, they're good enough to marry. I know, I know you've said before that, uh, uh, you, you know, you don't, you don't marry someone to improve yourself, right? You're already perfect. But, you know, there, you're always improving yourself. There's no way, you know, you, you're not perfect before you're married <laughs> or even after you're married. But you don't realize that until you're married. <laughs> <laughs> Marriage will bring improvement, but you don't marry for the improvement. Hmm. You marry for the marriage. Marriage has many perks. But you don't choose an airline based on the peanuts they serve. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, stay tuned. Yeah. What do you say? Thank you. I have a question. Um, how can someone overwin uh, obstacles with an addiction? Mm. If someone, he, what I see from someone is that someone is afraid to face difficult problems. Um, but that person is a believer. Even he's my best friend. And maybe it will change somewhere in the future. I'm not sure. There are some good treatments for addictions. If it really is an addiction, and uh, if there aren't other problems that need to be taken care of first, there, there are good treatments. But that's not marriage counseling. Mm -hmm. It's not a marriage problem. It's a health problem. So can you marry someone who has a background with addiction? No. No. You don't marry someone who already is not available to you. 
hoping that they'll become available. You marry the person for who they are right now. Mm -hmm. And if right now they're not marriageable, then you don't marry. You don't be, you don't become the nurse or the doctor or the psychiatrist in the in the relationship. <clears throat> so they should get the treatment first, then think of marriage. That's interesting and confusing. And yeah. I know we that's that. marriage counseling. <laughs> that's marriage advice. Don't marry someone who is not already good enough to be married to. Changes the rules. I don't know exactly where he's standing. Huh? I don't know where that person is standing. Hmm. I know that person has made a long way. Um, maybe grown up with the same kind of mother um, who couldn't be there enough during our youth. And he wanted to serve God, but met, uh, met the wrong people in the Christian way and in the different surface way so he lost his soul and he tried to find it back and he had an easy life but it also make addiction in society like you were a student hang out drink alcohol and it's fun and um so he's not like that anymore but he's still connected to things from the past and he so doesn't know how to solve it here's the marriage issue there are people who have problems who have difficulties in life but they're not married to those difficulties they're not married to their hurt if they're married to the hurt and to the difficulties then they're not available for marriage they're already married Mm -hmm. not, they're not available that's a problem if they get healed and suddenly do become available that's a good hope but you don't get married on a hope it's even possible that once they get over their problem they may not even want to marry you so it's too much of a risk Marry the person for who you see in front of your eyes now, not what they might become. In other words, he has to be available now, not in the future. How can you see that? Well, if it's an addiction, it means that he's married to the problem. I don't see that, but I'm not sure I see ever, everything because we have done that connection because I'm not 24 hours there. <laughs> but you may at be least right. he's making more connection to the society now. And yeah, You may be right. Maybe it's not even an addiction. It's yeah, I think so. And there's more hope for the marriage. He helped me in troubled times. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that he's available for marriage. Yeah. So. Where do you recognize it? It's hard. Because you already like him. So you got to get a, an objective opinion. Mm-hmm. Somebody who knows him and knows you. And take take that opinion seriously.
Well, our work cut out for us. So. Thank you. Um, one more question is, um, how would, would this course be applicable for older, divorced, or widowed men or women? Well, it, it does have a lot of wisdom about life that, of course, is absolutely necessary in a marriage, but it's probably good for life itself. Most older people, when they hear all about what makes a good marriage, they're all saying, yep, that's what I did, that's what I did, that's what I had. <laughs> it confirms, and that feels very good. Or it explains, aha, so that's what was wrong with my wife. <laughs> Or that's what was wrong with my husband. I knew it. So what nights? What time? Um, so I think it's... it's uh, The, the email is going to go out with the exact dates. I don't see it on the advertisement. 23rd, 24th, 25th. I think that's what it is. Um... But um, if you want, you sign up and you'll get all the information. Uh, it's going to be a journey. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you never know where the where, where we end up. <laughs> Based on everyone's questions, every time we you do a marriage course, it, it, more is uncovered. So this would be a real treat for anyone who signs up and joins. And... Um, this can change the world, each one home at a time, that the marriage becomes stronger. This is how we make a better world. So we look forward to, to fixing the world together by, by working on our individual homes. Thank you, Rabbi Friedman. Honored to be here with you tonight. We look forward to the course and um, have a good night. Good night and all the news.